when that's the environment that you're used to and that's where all your friends are and that's what you do it's quite hard to just suddenly drop it hello everyone welcome this is whistlekick martial arts radio episode 438 today my guest is master ian armstrong I'm Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, the founder here at Whistlekick, and just a guy who loves martial arts, training, talking about it, pretty much the whole gamut. If it relates to martial arts, I'm probably into it. And that's why we do what we do, like the show. We do the show twice a week. We offer a variety of products at whistlekick.com and at Amazon. And we've got other things going on, like Marshall Journal. And Well, the best thing to do is go to whistlekick.com. Check out all the links, see everything we got going on. And if you make a purchase, which helps support the show, of course, and keeps it going, use the code PODCAST15, saves you 15%, lets us know that by doing the show, it's turning into some sales. Because really, it's the only way we know. Today's guest, well, the moment you hear his voice, you'll probably have an idea of where he is, and that'll tell you where he's from, but it's not where he is now. Master Armstrong lives really half a world away doing what he loves, passing on the knowledge that he's gained. And it's very clear that he's doing it the way that he feels is best, the way that makes the most sense for the type of training he enjoys and wants to hand down to the next generation of martial artists. We had a great conversation. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. So here we go. Master Armstrong, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Of course, thanks. Thanks for coming on. You know, we've got one of these here where I'm starting. You know, we're we're starting our conversation here early for me, late for you. Yep. Because you're on the other side of the globe. I am indeed. In fact, uh, I mean, we're right up in the mountains in the very northwest of Thailand. So from where I am, it's about thirty kilometers to Burma. Um, wow. Okay. So yeah, Thailand's most remote province. The, okay. the only province in Thailand not to have a cinema. Yeah. None at all? No, no cinemas, no shopping malls, oh, no. uh, wow. and only one main road runs right through the province. Yeah. Okay. Now, people don't tend to end up in extremely remote areas like that by chance. It's usually by choice. Was there a, was there a reason you ended up there? Oh, that's very complex. Um, but, I mean, I've spent the whole of my adult life uh, kind of engrossed in Kung Fu. And somehow for the Kung Fu ideal, for the, the, the ultimate Kung Fu score, I think up in the, the remote mountains of Asia, uh, mid the forest and mid the clouds is... Is how that's how I see the ideal kung fu school, yeah, which is pretty much what I've tried to create here. Obviously, one the, the obvious question is, well, why are you in Thailand, not China? I did my key training in Singapore, so my teacher and the school that I'm part of, based in Singapore. Uh, when I started in the 1980s. China was pretty much off limits. You couldn't get a visa to go to China. And anyway, most of the best Kung Fu masters were kicked out of China after the Civil War. So they tended to concentrate in places like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia. So we've been training in Southeast Asia since the 80s. And I always used to travel up with my teacher to Thailand. Um, we had a kind of a deal whereby in order for him to kind of concentrate on Kung Fu, he needed to get away from all the kind of hassle of Singapore. So I would pay for him to travel up to Thailand, have a holiday in Thailand, and in return he'd teach me Kung Fu. And it was a bit of an excuse to get away from his wife, really, and have some fun in Thailand. But uh, we used to get an overnight bus because this was long before budget budget airlines. So we'd get the overnight bus from Singapore through Malaysia 
And in those days, part of the part of the bus journey was on dirt road. It's very different to now. We bus it up through Malaysia into the south of Thailand and then spend a while in Thailand training. So I've yeah, been training Kung Fu in Thailand since end of the 80s, start of the 90s. Um, and it's a pretty good place to be. Yeah, it's a pretty nice place to be. Yeah, Thailand's certainly on my list for for travel. Possibly the next place. We'll we'll have to see. It's, yeah. it's definitely, well, you, definitely you definitely need to pass a visit here. You got a job. Well, I would I would love to. Yeah. I'd love to. Yeah. But I, I think anybody listening can can hear your accent and, and say, you know, there's there's something there. You don't sound Thai. No, no, no. I'm very you sound like you're from somewhere else. Yeah. How'd you end up there? Oh yeah, simple one. Um, my wife is Thai. Uh, that's a good question. A lot of people ask this question. I first of all, so I, yeah, for the for the benefit of all your 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 listeners, um, if you can't tell from my accent, I'm English. And first of all, I was thinking about could I set up a residential kung fu training centre in England, right from yeah, kind of mid 80s i've been running training camps residential training camps kung fu but we would we'd hire caravans or we'd, we'd hire higher accommodation for a week and you know concentrate on training sometimes it was even tent sometimes we'd be camping and when i trained in singapore it was it was full-time full-time training so we fly over there and then live at the Kung Fu school. And it was Kung Fu focus all, all day, yeah, 24 seven. Um, and the way that you learn in, in that situation is, is very different to the, the classic kind of, I go down to the martial arts cup two nights a week. Um, and I always wanted to give more of my students that opportunity to kind of really immerse themselves in learning and training. So wouldn't it be great if our Kung Fu camps became permanent? Well, in England, the weather is against you. Costs are against you. And kind of over-regulation of business is against you. So it wasn't going to happen. And then we started looking at southern Spain. So from from England, that doesn't seem too far away, but it's a lot warmer and the food's better uh, and it's cheaper. Mm. And it's an easier environment in which to operate. So I had a good look at southern Spain. The, the reality was that at the time we were doing really well in England. Um, uh, my martial arts centre was booming and just wasn't the incentive to to set up a new venture uh, and then I met my present wife uh, it was just the very beginning of 2006 yeah, and my wife's Thai so I started coming to Thailand to visit yeah my future wife We'd, I'd always travel to Thailand quite regularly because Going out to train in Singapore, we'd always spend time in Thailand. But yeah, this time uh, came over to visit Boo, my wife, and then I started thinking, mm, you know what? Now this would be a really good place for that residential kung fu school because here the weather's really good. It's much cheaper. The food's really good. Um, it's just a really nice country to be in. Lots of people come here to travel, come here to holiday. And at that time, it was actually pretty easy to set up business here. So it's like, okay, yeah, this looks like it could be a goer. And we looked around at a, a number of different places in, in Thailand, but eventually we chose this one. And... Uh, yeah, in retrospect, I think it was a pretty good decision. Now and again, you'll always think somewhere else, but overall, yeah, I think we made a pretty good choice. 
I want to talk about this desire for for a full time center. This is something I think a lot of martial arts instructors dream of, but few actually set out to create. But before we get there, I want to go back to your beginnings with kung fu. I assume it started in the UK. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me just think about how the best answer that. So I could talk all night, but I'll kind of spare you that. I came from a an area environment, a family where you, you needed to fight. It's a very, very aggressive kind of environment. And I wasn't a, a kid with good social skills. You know, if you got the if you got the mouth you can talk your way out of the situations. If you haven't you gotta fight your way out. So I kind of grew up having a fight and for a long time, I was very sceptical about martial arts. My, my brother did judo, and I wasn't having any of it because I couldn't see the point of having a fight and not being able to punch somebody. So I looked at it as well. No one's beaten me yet, so I don't think I need to need to learn this. You know, I'll just just keep fighting. Um, and I went on like that till I was fourteen, and then I got beaten by a boxer. And he really pounded my nose in. It took a week to stop the bleeding. And it still bends over to one side. You can still see where it's been broken. And I thought, you know what? I think it's time I started going in boxing. So before the nose had healed, I was up to the local boxing club. And boxed for about two years. But truthfully, I wasn't going to make it as a boxer. Um, it wasn't. And I'm not somebody that likes to settle for second best. You know, I want to be, I want to be up there. I want to be the best. So, why wouldn't you have made it as a boxer? Why wouldn't you have been the best? When you get into that kind of competitive environment, I mean, we were sparring. I would spar five or six kids a week, and I wasn't winning anymore. Um, I was clearly, I did, I clearly didn't have outstanding talent as a boxer. I wasn't a natural. And okay, I'm kind of digressing a little bit now, but we'll come back. Totally fine. In over the years, I've trained a lot of people for com- competition fighting. I was for a number of years. I was coach to the British Sandar team. So Sandar is the uh, Chinese full contact fighting is part of the um, wushu competition. Um, Chinese boxing. Uh, they used to take the British teams to the European Championships, World Championships. I coached a lot of guys up, and almost all of the people that come, you know, they're not going to make it to the top. And yeah, now and again, you get a a student who is outstandingly talented and it's like yeah if you if you stick it out you train hard you don't get distracted you might do it um but not everybody has got what it takes to be you know the the, the top man um and you know that even even as a, a 14 year old you know, I was winning some, losing some, but you know, I knew full well that I wasn't going to the top. Um, that's that's how it is. You, some people have the idea, the um, the notion that you can take anybody, and if you give them the the right martial arts teacher, they will be the next Conor McGregor. Um, but it's it's just not like that. Some people have got it in them, but most of them haven't. Yeah, that's that's my opinion after sort of forty years of doing this. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't heading for the top in boxing. So, I just went back to street fighting, and it was only when I started university that I got the chance to do kind of like full-on martial arts. So, again, back when I was a, a child, 
and I decided not to do judo. I wanted to do karate. But in the 60s, people thought that karate meant you did this kind of weird chop and uh, onto somebody's shoulder and they dropped dead. Um, and that's, that was true. That was what my mum thought karate was back in the 1960s. So there was no way I was going to do that because I would be karate chopping people and killing them all over the place. And that's not what you want your son to do. So no karate for me. Um, and in a typical kind of suburban town, small town, you wouldn't find any kind of exotic martial arts. Maybe karate, definitely judo. But beyond that, Probably not much. Um, but when I went to university up in central London, then, yeah, they've got loads. Um, so I signed up for a club which did Kung Fu and Taekwondo. So a bit of a, bit of a weird mix. But I like the look of it. So it's, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Got the opportunity, I'm going to do it. And the Kung Fu part of it was run by a guy who had trained at Nam Yang Fugitistic Association in Singapore. Uh, he was a student of my present teacher. And he'd come over to study at the University of London and he'd been encouraged to start up a little Kung Fu club there. Um, so that was, that was what I signed up for and been doing it ever since. Uh, in the end, I had to choose between the Kung Fu and the Taekwondo, so I dropped the Taekwondo because the Kung Fu was just a bit more interesting for me. Something with a lot of depth, yeah, a lot of depth to Kung Fu, and I kind of like that. And I guess, you know, to kind of maybe to, to sort of, um, elaborate on that a bit probably for the first four years of doing the kung fu i wasn't that serious at it um because i was also trying to pass my degree at university which um, meant i couldn't spend all my time focusing on martial arts and then as the time ticked by kind of got more into it more into it and i'd had a you know through my kind of Teenage years going into my 20s, we used to fight a lot. Um, yeah, not martial arts, just, just kind of street fights. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a kind of one of my, the Kung Fu teachers that was very influential on, on me uh, said to me a lot later in my life, when you take a bus, you better make sure you know when to get off. And that life that I've been living is starting to get a little bit too crazy. And there, when you're a, a kind of a fighter in the, in the cities, it's only a matter of time before either you get badly hurt or you end up in prison. Yeah. That's, that's the only place you can go unless you just kind of get out of it. Uh, and when you're used to uh, this kind of thing, you're used to having a, a, a life of fighting a lot, and to just suddenly drop it is, is very difficult. But the martial arts is something that gives you the a discipline, and you end up with a teacher who's a kind of mentor who's guiding you in a positive direction, and it takes all that kind of uncontrolled energy and it, it points you in a direction and you start to do something with it. So when I got really seriously into Kung Fu, I think it was kind of this time that I knew I've got to make a change. Yeah, I've got to, things have got to change, otherwise they're going to go bad. Um, and it's kind of, it gave my life a different direction and the kind of throwing myself into it, going over to train in Singapore, uh, kind of becoming a martial arts teacher, it was, it was a good thing for me uh, because it gave me a direction, it gave me something different. 
mm. to do. Yeah. It, it's quite the 180. I mean, to start off fighting on the street and boxing because a boxer bested you mm. and then back to box, uh, street fighting on the street and ultimately stepping into embrace traditional martial arts. That's quite the transition. Yeah. Um, the funny thing is that for most people, they, they, they do martial arts because they want to learn to fight. Um, and I, in many respects, was doing it to get me away from fighting. Actually, when I started, it was you always want to be a, you always want to be a better fighter and you always want to be, have more of an edge because you don't want to come second. So it's always, there's always that attraction. I want to be a better fighter. I want to be a better fighter. But yeah, I think by the time I was in my kind of mid twenties, it's this realization. Yeah. You know, something's got to change. And yeah, I was a fairly aggressive young man. Um, People who know me now would think, no, no, there's no way that Master Ian could have been kind of aggressive or nasty or whatever because he's got this really kind of calm kung fu master, but not in those days. Uh, where did that come from? Where where was that aggression rooted? In just the the area where I grew up and the life that that I'd led. Um, you had to you had to be tough and aggressive otherwise you were going to get really kind of put down and put upon and bullied um so when i first started school i used to get bullied a lot and before long you know i was one of the kids that was bullying the, bullying the other kids because you had a choice yeah you either toughen up and be one of the tough kids or you get beaten up every day and the whole kind of culture in the part of, I'm from the southern edge of London and most of London you, you have this culture where it's all about being tough, it's all about being hard. Who's the, who's the hardest? Yeah. Who's the hard man? Pretty similar in, in cities around most of the world, I guess, but everybody's trying to be the toughest. Everybody's trying to be the hardest. Uh, and the further you work your way up the stack, the, the tougher it gets and the higher the odds are. So you just, and you become used to it. You become used to it. The more frequently the, you fight, the more normal it is to fight. And the more focused you are on fighting. That's, that's how it works. And as the fights get rougher, you get rougher to match. Otherwise, somehow you've got to kind of drop out. So there's always that pressure. You always you're always getting tougher, yeah. and you can look in from the outside at a at a, a situation like that, and say, well, you can just step out of that. You know, you don't have to be the toughest. You don't have to be fighting all the time, and it's it's kind of true. But when that's the environment that you're used to. Um, and that's where all your friends are and that's what you do, it's quite hard to just suddenly drop it. I can't even remember how we got onto this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let me, let me have a think. Um, sure. Well, we yeah. were talking about the, yeah. the transition from, from being a fighter to Doing kind of a yeah. martial artist. So uh, I, at that time, you know, I... I knew deep down I, I needed a discipline and I needed somebody that could kind of uh, kind of put me straight. And it just so happened that in 1987, I got uh, to be part of a team from the UK that went out to Singapore for a demonstration and competition in Singapore. And when we got there, the, the guys there, they, they, were, they were tough. They were tough cookies. Um, and that suited me just right because that was what I needed. Um, for me at that time, I didn't, 
need a kind of a a nice, calm, philosophical martial arts teacher. Um, I didn't really need the classical Mr. Miyagi. You know, I needed some pretty, pretty tough guys that I could look up to, that I could relate to. Um, and yeah, in, in Singapore, I found that. Uh, so it kind of clicked. And I guess in many respects, I was the kind of student that a lot of Kung Fu teachers are looking for because I could already fight yeah, and didn't need to be taught exactly how to fight. It was just, okay, now we'll make you do it properly. Now we'll sharpen you up. Um, now we'll coordinate you. Now we'll get you thinking straight, looking straight. Um, and we did you know, a lot of very traditional um, training. Uh, but, yeah, that was, you know, I ended up, I found by chance just the right club where they, they were really tough. And the boss, the, the, the master there, spoke very good English um, and you know in in that era in even now actually even now in Kung Fu it's not difficult to find a, a Chinese teacher but it's incredibly difficult to find one that speaks good English and when they don't speak good English they can't convey any of the deeper kind of concepts of the art you can you can show the basic moves but you can't communicate the depth of the art and the fine points of the art if you can't use language. So, yeah, it was kind of lucky. And that's, that's how it all started. Yeah. Mm. One of the things that we hear come through in, in these stories on the show is how a very slight, even slightly different roll of the dice means that the student may not have found the right instructor. Here you're talking about really needing an instructor who trains and, and teaches in an aggressive enough style that it's going to resonate for you, yep. but also have the communication skills to provide you the depth to what you're training. And it sounds like, you know, we're, we're talking about a very narrow, as you said, a very narrow subset of Kung Fu teachers in that region and your life would have been completely different. Definitely. Yeah. And yeah. we hear that week after week and it continues to blow my mind. And the only thing that I can think of is that old adage, when the student is ready, the master appears. There, yeah. there really yeah. feels like there's something almost supernatural about it. Yep. Yeah. You know, there's two ways you can look at it. You can, do your statistics and your mathematical stuff, or you can say, well, this is the tower, this is the way of the universe. Um, you know, things happen because they're meant to happen. But, yeah, that's, that's martial arts for you, I guess. I wonder, you know, whether, what extent it will continue. I don't know if you have this big debate now in, in martial arts which kind of says our oh, traditional martial arts dead because it's all about MMA. But, you know, you go to an MMA school, I don't think you get that kind of uh, dynamic between student and teacher that you do in the traditional martial arts. So to me, the, it's two different things. Um, there's always going to be a, a role for the old style stuff. I agree. I completely agree. And not to say that there aren't MMA schools out there that don't bring some of those traditional elements, the culture, the formality, the training methods in, but they're, ex they're the exception, yeah, not the rule based on what I've heard and what I've seen. Mm. Well, I mean, Kung Fu, uh, well, Shaolin, Shaolin Kung Fu uh, is generally to have started about 500 AD when the, the monk Bodhidharma uh, was appointed abbot of the Shaolin Temple. It's got about 1500 year history. MMA 
Uh, you, you could probably debate exactly when it started, but it was not much over 20 years ago. And there's not a, there hasn't been a lot of time to develop a culture and a tradition. Um, for Westerners studying Asian martial arts, as well as studying the martial art, you really start to study the culture that it's associated with. So you study Kung Fu, you start, you start to really study Chinese culture, you start to need to understand the philosophies that underlie it, which in the case of Kung Fu, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, I mean, these are the principal philosophies that have influenced it. If you study karate, Aikido, you're going to be studying Japanese culture, Japanese philosophies. If you do Muay Thai, maybe you're studying kind of Thai culture. Uh, if you train in a Western art, do you really study your own culture? I, I don't think so. Yeah, it's more just kind of concentrating on the training. So. Yeah, different. Mm. It's a very different thing you get out of it. Absolutely. When you think about your early training, where did those roots for full time school and and building these? I don't know if we can call it a retreat. Yeah. But this destination training facility. You know, when when did when did those ideas start? So, the first trip to China in Singapore was eighty seven, and I went back in eighty nine. Uh, and in 92, I went back on my own. That's the first time I made the journey on my own. And from then on, I used to go once or twice a year to train in Singapore. And in Singapore, we had our own clubhouse. So every Kung Fu club, and there were loads, had its own premises. You couldn't not have premises. You had to have somewhere where, where you were based, where you kept all your weapons, all the equipment where the people met. So they would have full-time schools over there and we would go and we'd sleep at the school. So we, we effectively turned their Kung Fu school into uh, a Kung Fu retreat, at least temporarily, yeah. by turning up, <laughs> turning up there and sleeping on the floor. So that was my kind of really influential training. That was the training that um, kind of set me up. And you can't come back to the West and teach a few nights a week in a, a hired hall and get the same result, the same atmosphere. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. Uh, so the Trying to recreate that was always my goal in the West. And first of all, we did it by having these training camps. So we'd go away for a weekend or a week, and then we'd train full time. And then, uh, let me think, in 1998 was when I got my first full time martial arts center in the UK. Um, and that was a massive step. But the students aren't there all the time. You know, they come in different evenings. And we used to train at the weekends as well. So some of them would be there five days a week, but it's never quite the same um, as, you know, it's not just the training together, it's the kind of eating together, the whole kind of, you spend all your time with the other martial arts people. You, you talk martial arts, you eat martial arts. Um, it's the whole kind of immersion experience and having a full-time martial arts center is a great step forward but it's still it's not it. it doesn't get you there so the next step was setting up the residential center um and even when when you don't have a full-time training center you blame the fact that you don't train enough on the fact that you haven't got a full-time place. When you get a full-time place, it's like, oh yeah, but 
Clive, people can't come at this time. They can't come at that time. That's why we're not training full time. That's why we're not training enough. And then when you get the the retreat where they they're here all the time, um, you got all their time here, and you find you still can't do all the training that you wanted to do because you just haven't got enough energy. You just run out of gas. So. Always, you'll always be wanting to do more than you actually can, but you, when you get to the, the kind of residential school, that's you know, it's about as far as you can go. Yeah. Tell us about this school, this this facility, whatever you 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 call it, because school sounds sounds like it's not as all encompassing a term. Yes, yeah. this, this location that you have in Thailand. Yeah. Tell us about that. What, what, is, what does it look like? What is the training like? Who's training there? Give us the skinny. <clears throat> so we're kind of spread across the mountainside up in the north of Thailand. And we've got our, uh, what we call training areas. Um, we call them. So, Matted areas where we train, yeah. Two of them are roofed, one of them is open. Um, but the ones with roofs don't have walls. So uh, it's a kind of open-sided training area. It rarely gets cold here, so you don't have to worry about it getting cold. Uh, so it's great to be able to train with the breeze kind of uh, coming through. Um, you need a roof to protect you from the sun and the rain, but uh, yeah, they're not walled in. So you've got a great view all the time looking out over the mountains. Uh, and we've got a gym with the, with the, um, the various training equipment. Uh, we've got a room where we keep all the weapons. So we actually, we turn it into a sort of Kung Fu museum. So our club in Singapore closed down couple of years ago and we managed to rescue quite a lot of the stuff from there the, the weapons some of the old trophies the books um and shipped them up to thailand so we are kung fu museum which is kind of bristling with all sorts of kung fu weapons um we got our own uh, sort of restaurant here uh, kitchen canteen however you like to call it where we eat um, and then we've got sleeping quarters. So some people have, usually it's shared two to a room. We've got a few private rooms. We charge more for those. Uh, and yeah, it's kind of creeping up the mountainside. Uh, and it's quite, everything's quite spread out. So you need to walk from one place to the next. And that's good because you're out in the fresh air, kind of moving around. You get get the good chi, you get the good views, you get a bit of fresh air and sunlight. That's a pretty good way to live. So I kind of did. Yes, it's my my project of of creating what I viewed as being the ultimate. Ah. Uh, martial arts training camp um yeah it's kind of living the dream yeah. it sounds like it and i'm sure we have a lot of instructors listening right now nodding along that understanding the ability to train more the ability to train deeper yeah when you can dedicate yourself and from the people that we've talked to at least on on this show from my experiences it seems like this is more common with kung fu with chinese arts than it is with japanese okinawan korean arts is that your experience too or or maybe maybe you can't make a make a judgment on that i can't make an informed judgment because i'm quite specialized to kung fu i don't have so much knowledge of other uh, Asian martial arts 
Well, actually, no. I, well, I kind of do because Thai boxing and Burmese boxing, yeah, I have got quite a good idea what they do because of where I'm based. And they run, they have training camps. And they very often live at the, um, at the training camp. So they do it a lot. Um, on the other hand, I do tend to obviously keep an eye on uh, what's happening in the marketplace. And they're setting up, the idea of setting up the, the residential training centre is becoming more and more popular. Um, when I look at Western people setting up residential training centres, yeah, there's still not that many. There's still not many. And I maybe there's a few more in Kung Fu than there are in the Japanese martial arts, but the number is still pretty small. Um, whereas I believe that in the States there are quite a few uh, sort of residential MMA camps. And also down in Brazil, um, you've got a lot of um, places in Brazil doing MMA and BJJ. In China, then it is, there's a lot of uh, places offering residential Kung Fu training. And that started off with the, um, the, the kind of very, the commercialization of Shaolin Temple in China. <laughs> and that got to a point where it was actually a, a national significance because of the amount of foreign currency that it was drawing into China. Uh, and when they ran out of room around the Shaolin Temple to build any more martial arts schools, they kind of spread out to Wutang Mountain and various other locations in China. So going to China to train is, is a very big business. Um, in Japan, you don't seem to get anything like so much. There are martial arts schools in Japan that are open to foreigners, but it's, it's not big business for them. But the amount of money that a foreigner pays for martial arts training to someone in rural China seems like quite big money and to somebody in Japan probably seems it's just not worth it. That's my thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thailand is somewhere in the middle. Um, Thais don't own anything like as much as Japanese, but a bit more than more than China. Yeah. More than China. Hmm. Yeah. So All right. how has your training, if if we if we look at now and your not the very earliest days of your of your training. But the early days where you said you were serious about it, and it sounded like that was just after you finished at university. If we contrast those two periods of time, what's changed for you? So when I contrast between which two periods? The... Now? Yep. Oh, now. And hmm. yeah, now, now and, and then. Yeah. Uh... Well, the truthful answer is now I'm getting old. Um, it gets <laughs> harder every year. Yeah, and it's kind of it's kind of funny, but it's not funny. Um, I'm going to be 57 next month, um, and it it's really starting to get a lot more difficult. The the energy's not there that that used to be there. Um, so now, technically, I'm pretty good. But I don't have the energy that I used to have. Uh, in the beginning, I had loads of energy, but the technical skill wasn't there. Um, so in the, in the beginning, I used to do loads and loads of physical training. Um, now, I concentrate more on the technical training. Um, 
but to kind of give you an in, a more interesting um, insight. I, I would say that, yeah, I started training in 1991. I started kind of really doing it seriously um, five or six days a week, probably about 85. And first trip to Singapore was 87, training in Singapore. And I'm going to get the date right. 1993. Yeah, that's when I won my first world championship. Um, and that was in Los Angeles in the States. Uh, we haven't even talked about competition. Tell us more about that. Um, as a youngster, I mean, you, I think it's normal that you want to do competitions. Um, and you're kind of testing yourself out. You're testing your boundaries. Uh, and I used to do, I used to do competitions, um, and I got, yeah, one British champion, uh, doing weapon routines. So I got picked for the international team. So we got sent either to the States and you got a gold medal doing the double axes. And that was my my first world championship win. Um, and about say four to six weeks after my one night world championship, I went back to Singapore to train with my teacher. And you know, he did the he was the kind of classic Chinese Kung Fu teacher, he sort of said to me, ah, so now you're world champion. Mm. I think it's time we started training properly. So we then proceeded to spend six weeks on horse dance training. Not just horse dance, but the walking stance as well. But he said, okay, this year, uh, I'm going to sort your stance out. And we just did stance work, stance work, straight back, straight back. And that was it. Yeah. Um, came back from winning the world championships and he decided to work on my horse stance. But um, I think from that point on, it was okay. Well, you know what? We better take this one seriously. Um, so we went right back to basics. six. Just, just kind of like, okay, everything you learned, throw it out the window because we're going to learn to do it properly now. Um, and that was what we did. The um, stance training. The next year it was some chen, the first routine, the basic routine. Um, and I got kind of used to what are we going to do? How are we going to do the basics? So we spent years on that. And then he I said, okay, so one year, uh, so we'll be doing some chen training again. I think. No, let's do the more advanced forms this year. And it's like, you know, I almost fell over kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, actually, yeah. Decided that uh, you're actually getting somewhere. So that's a kind of good good insight in the, into how it used to be. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's something really telling in that statement this year we're going to work on the advanced forms <laughs> yeah yeah that, that really is okay yeah grasshopper i think you're ready to leave the tent um it was and there was always this this was the funny thing there was always an assumption that as a non-chinese you were never going to make it in kung fu um because only chinese people ever made it in kung fu uh and you know, to a large extent, they were right because it was almost unheard of for uh, to get a foreigner who could do it properly, um, and it still is. And I was kind of lucky because I had a teacher who's patient, um, and he's kind of quite a 
he thinks outside the box. And he used to say to me, Ian, yeah, if you want to succeed in Kung Fu, you have to start to think like a Chinese. And I spent years and years trying to get my head around how Chinese people think. Um, and you do, you do need to, you need to start thinking like a Chinese. You need to start living your life like a Chinese. It helps a lot to read up on kind of Chinese philosophy, Chinese thinking. Um, but and the funny thing was that most of the Westerners, not just at our club, I mean, we, Kung Fu was incredibly networked in Southeast Asia. So everybody knew everybody else and everybody went to socialize to visit the network with everybody else so you know sometimes five nights a week we would be out with other kung fu clubs and some of them would have western students and the generally the consistent uh thing was that the westerners dropped out they they do it for a while and they give up they drop out and I didn't drop out. And of all the, all the people that started with us, it was only myself and one other guy, my training brother, Dugo, that, that didn't give up, didn't drop out. And it started to be, they started to latch onto this, that it's, you know, okay, this guy is really serious. This guy actually follows his teacher, does all his teacher says, he's polite, he's respectful. And the suddenly doors open and people start teaching you things and you know people start talking to you uh, and step by step yeah, you know we started to to learn how to really do it and 2006 we went to China and we were right out in Yeah, somewhere where you don't see many Westerners. Uh, at dinner with various other um, kind of really high up Kung Fu masters. And when you, when you go to dinner, you know, typically partway through dinner, you have to get up and demonstrate your Kung Fu. Um, that's, that's how it is. They don't have a kind of formal demonstration. You go out to dinner and partway through dinner, everybody kind of gets up and does a Kung Fu routine. Uh, and you know, they looked at it, it was myself and Dougal, my training rubber there. And they looked at us and their jaws just kind of dropped and it's like, hold on a minute. These two foreigners are actually doing Kung Fu properly. That's not supposed to happen. Yeah. They're not Chinese, how can they do it? Um, and of course, my, my teacher is absolutely gloating, you know, yes, yes, you, you've had to accept that my students can actually do it. Um, but they normally, the, the Chinese generally assume that as a Westerner, you've got no hope whatsoever. But if you actually get it, they're, they're, they're very, very impressed. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that was really kind of gratifying. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. Now, today we've talked about the past. We've talked a bit about what's going on today. Yep. Let's look into the future. You know, and I'll let you choose the horizon if we're looking out, you know, six months or 10 years or something in between or even beyond. What are you working for or towards? Do you have goals? Are there things that you're striving to accomplish? Um, yeah, quite definitely. The, the role of any martial arts master is to pass on their art and I mean this is particularly relevant with something like Kung Fu uh, our association was set up in 1954 um, so I am the third generation and you know we've we, 
since 1954, we've gained in strength, we've grown in strength. And, you know, we've got the real full undiluted Chinese Kung Fu. And my task is clear. It's to pass it on to the next generation so that when I'm gone, the art and the club are still alive. So the master's job is to safeguard the art through to the next generation. That's what it is. Um, I think people get, there's a lot of misconceptions about this master. You know, what does a master mean? Does it mean I'm the, the, the greatest martial artist in the world? You know, does it mean I'm perfect? Uh, no, it means you're the one with the responsibility that you've got to keep it alive. You're the kind of custodian of the art and your job is to make sure it doesn't die. So for me, that's it. And it's a hard task. Um, I've got a lot of good students, but none of them are ready to, to take it on, take on the role. And I can already feel that I can't, I can't do what I used to be able to do. Um, I'm not, for my age, actually physically I'm pretty good, but there's that for my age thing, 57, uh, another 10 years I'm going to be 67, how much will I be able to do then? Yeah. Another 15 years, I'm 72. So I've got to pass it on. And that's really, I guess, what I'm a bit preoccupied with at the moment. Uh, that I've worked all my adult life to, to kind of promote this association, this art. But it's time now to, to pass it on. And uh, it's, it's kind of a hard thing. And then, again, looking to the future, everybody has to kind of steer their club, their art, their group. They have to make difficult choices. And you have to say, well, what's relevant about Kung Fu? Is it, is it still relevant in... 2019, is it? Is there still any point to it? Is it still appropriate? Um, to me, the answer is it's a definite yes. But I mean, we don't live in the kind of violent society that we used to live in. You know, everything now is getting more regulated, more controlled. It depends a bit where you are. But you tend not to need to, to fight so much. Um, but on the other hand, Kung Fu, in some respects, it's the kind of physical manifestation of Zen. Um, Kung Fu is very much about the kind of mind-body link. Yeah. Mind, body, spirit, breath. Uh, and it's a way of accessing your mind through your body. And there's absolutely no doubt that stress levels in our modern society are going through the roof. Um, And the more that people become stressed, uh, the more that they're overstimulated, the mind is overstimulated, um, the more they need something which fixes that. And Kung Fu does the job. Uh, 
Kung Fu is a great way to calm the mind, to connect the body and the mind, to get you thinking deeper, thinking clearer, thinking more creatively. And you know, my take is that as we progress over the next whatever 20 years, the need to physically defend yourself is going to go down and down. Or the need to look after yourself mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that need is going to go up and up and up as the world becomes more stressed and more screwed up. It's going to be more and more difficult to hold it together. And Kung Fu addresses that. And it's kind of, that's where I see the, the biggest relevance of what we do maybe in the next 20 years or so. Um, now, I have some students that are quite convinced that uh, society is going to break down fairly soon and then it's going to be a free for all. And then you'll really need your, your physical Kung Fu. And may, maybe you will. Um, I think it's going to take a bit more than 20 years. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully it takes a very long time. Hopefully it's never. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. Is it, maybe if you really like the violent side of martial arts, maybe you're busting for it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I it, think it's going to be a challenging, um, time during perhaps my children's lifetime but uh, I, yeah I think the next 20 years okay things are going to be tough but the big the big challenges are going to come from the the stress that our society yeah. puts on us yeah. I would agree if people want to learn more about you and and your school, yeah, the, the center. Uh, again, I'm I'm struggling with the right word for what to call it because it seems to transcend my my ideals. Kung Fu retreat, yeah. Kung Fu retreat. Okay. If if people want to learn more about your retreat or find you online in, in any yeah. capacity, where would they go? Kungfuretreat.com. Kungfuretreat.com. Um, Listen, type easy. that in and you and you go kungfuretreat.com if you can't remember that come from Thailand and look on that top okay yeah. great well this has been a lot of fun I've learned a lot about about you and your story today has been very different from a lot of the stories that we've heard and yet similar enough that I I can relate to it at least a bit yeah. and so I appreciate that yeah that's good um, and as as we head out I'd like to ask for you to send us out, you know, what parting words would you give to the listeners today? First one would be don't just work on your body, work on your mind. And if you do, you, you'll probably succeed a lot better. Um, in the second one, when I started martial arts, um, I want to be a, wanted to be a great fighter because that would fix my problems, yeah. If I had a problem with somebody, I'd just flatten them. Um, it doesn't work. So as I've kind of learned that, kind of focus a lot more attention on how to deal with people, yeah. Learn a lot more about human psychology, uh, how to persuade people rather than threaten people. And wish I'd kind of learned that earlier on, um, because that really makes a difference. So actually, the people skills are really important. And you make it a certain way in martial arts without them, but if you want to get to the top, yeah, you need to you need to have that. So work on your people skills. And you know, most definitely I've been in situations where I couldn't have fought my way out and I've taught my way out of them. Um, 
and that's why I'm still here. So, yeah, good to good to remember that. We're all different. We train different things in different places in different ways, and yet time and again, I find things about the guests and their training that just makes sense to me. I've long felt there was no superior style or method of training or even reason for training. And today's episode reinforces that for me. I can see the value in being in the jungle of Thailand, training hours every day. In fact, there's something incredibly romantic about it, and I hope that I get to do it. But that's not to say that that's necessarily the right way, at least not for me. And I hope that we can all get better from this episode, from other episodes, seeing the value in what each of us does and learning and sharing. Thank you, Master Armstrong, for coming on the show, for doing just that, for sharing, for being open with who you are and why you do what you do. If you want to check out the show notes, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. This is episode 438. You can find some photos, transcript, links, all kinds of good stuff to give you more information about this episode and Master Ian. If you want to learn more about what we do, go to whistlekick.com. Don't forget the code PODCAST15. It'll get you 15% off every single thing in the store. And that's one of the ways to help us out. How else can you help us? Sharing this or another episode, leaving us a review on Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Google, pretty much anywhere you could leave a review would be helpful to us. And if you want to follow us on social media, we are at Whistlekick everywhere you can think of. My email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's all I've got for you. Until next time, train hard, smile. And have a great day.